Hello and welcome everyone to who has tuned into our introduction event of the new event series of the Left Book Club. The Left Book Club is a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative. We want to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. We want to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas and inform actions and practical steps. We aim to support through our discussions uh, struggles fighting for us all. Uh, if you don't already, uh, if you want to already subscribe to the Left Book Club, please consider during and after this event. And also excitingly check out our radical gift guide on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook for December. This event is a part of Radical December by the Radical Publishing Alliance. And Radical December seeks to foreground the energy and urgency in radical publishing at the moment and to highlight the salience of radical ideas to crises ranging from mass incarceration, police violence to COVID and climate change. The events in this uh, during Radical December uh, feature speakers such as Angela Davis, Rachel Kushner and Gargi Bhattachari who we have here today. It will, they will cover discussions by many struggles, movement building and transnational freedom struggles and how how to pitch a book to a radical publisher. Um, many of you are probably uh, used to Breckner hosting Left Book Club events, and we just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Breckner for all the amazing work she's done for Left Book Club uh, over, over the years. And we have sadly seen uh, Breckner, but of course excited for her move on to other projects, um, but I'm sure somehow you will see her on Left Book Club events in other capacities at other points. Um, so today's event um, comes as a result of, as many may know, and has seen in the description of this as event, on the 24th of September, the UK government barred resources created by groups with so-called extreme political stances from being used in English classrooms. The list of stances included, and we quote, a publicly stated desire to overthrow capitalism. So today we're one of the crucial questions we're going to be asking is why is the state targeting anti-capitalist education and why today? So today, Gargi Bhattacharya is joined by an amazing guest speaker, Kojo Karam, for the introduction to this exciting new series developed with the Left Book Club who's afraid of anti-capitalism. So this is the introduction event, but the series will include sessions on anti-capitalism and imagination, anti-capitalism and love and care and food and work and many, many more exciting uh, topics that you need to stay tuned to see. <laughs> um, so uh, Gargi Bhattacharya is one of the UK's leading scholars on race and capitalism. She is the author of Rethinking Capitalism, Dangerous Brown Men, Traffic and co-author and co-authors co-author of Empire's Endgame. Kojo Karam, who is our special guest today, is a lecturer at the School of Law at Birkbeck College, University of London. He is the editor of The War on Drugs and the Global Color Line and co-author of Empire's Endgame. So just quickly about the format of this event. Um, there'll be an uh, introduction and outline of what we're discussing today by Gargi. And then uh, Gargi will be in conversation uh, with uh, Kojo Karam. And then we will be taking questions from you. So please um, ask your questions, submit your questions to uh, through the YouTube live stream. And we will definitely make sure that uh, our speakers get those questions. So thank you very much. And over to you, Gargi. OK, thanks so much, Elif. That's a lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming. I've never done this YouTube kind of style of presentation before. And as Aleph has already explained, that we've really started this series as a way to try and understand what is going on when the British government, who frankly nowadays barely say anything, you know, they're in hiding. The one thing they want to say is, oh, woe is me, anti-capitalism out of our schools. That's quite an interesting rhetorical and performative gesture at this moment in British politics. And as already been laid out, it's a strange piece of guidance. It comes under this relationship, sex and health curriculum guidance. 
So kind of those danger topics in British schools about, oh, how do you feel about the world? How do you feel about your body? Within that, there's this explicit um, new piece of guidance only for English schools to say nothing from any organisation that explicitly wants to overthrow capitalism. And that led to this whole kind of media coverage of oh, anti-capitalism in schools. It's so dangerous. It's so anti-democratic. It's so anti-Semitic, actually, which I think is an interesting code back to other bits of British politics. But it's also, even though it's a strange kind of gesture, a kind of backhanded recognition of our traditions. I've been saying to lots of people that you're kind of winning a little bit when the state says anti-capitalism, it's those people be afraid. Because um, it's free advertising, isn't it? It brings people to us. It raises awareness and curiosity of what, what our agenda is. And it kind of opens something up, you know, it'd be safer for them to say nothing. Despite all of that, there is a bit of a history in Britain of using the school curriculum of creating new kinds of folk demons. In particular, I think the um, concoction of anti-capitalism as a new danger for England's children is reminiscent of Section 28, something which is kind of my own personal history. People of my age in the 80s grew up with Section 28, which was a Thatcher endeavour to say that, oh, you can't teach you can't teach about same-sex relationships in schools. In particular, this phrase of um, to teach an acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. And at that time, in a similar way to this current moment of demonizing anti-capitalism, there wasn't a great deal of evidence that any school was actually doing that. There were some books held in school libraries, um, actually not even in school libraries, in the GLA Teaching Resource Library, but it allowed this whole kind of public furore about oh, they're teaching our children to be gay. Now they're teaching our children to be anti-capitalists in a similar way. It's a way of kind of demonizing teachers as a profession and also using people's anxiety about their children to say oh, something dangerous is going on. Of course, if anyone is joining us from outside Britain, I don't know if anyone is, you need to remember what's going on in this country in September. We're coming out of um, you know, the first phase of COVID. And in September, despite all of the talk about, you know, Boris Johnson does all of this militarized talk about as if we're fighting COVID on the beaches or whatever strange non-metaphor he's using. He's saying all of that, but in September already there starts to be an increasingly rapid rise in COVID cases and COVID deaths, which has carried on till now, till the end, end of November. I've not seen the be beginning of December rates, but I think it was 600 people died yesterday of COVID in Britain. So that crisis is going on. People have already been pushed out of work. It's a country that already had one of the biggest um, gaps between the rich and the poor across the developed world. COVID has made that many, many times worse. And even though people have forgotten, Brexit is coming. So that's going on at this moment where this strange performance of oh, anti-capitalism in schools. And the other thing that's going on is one of the core industrial disputes and issues of public debate is with the school teacher unions. Teacher unions are some of um, the strongest unions in Britain right now. School teaching is one of the high, most highly unionized professions High, most highly unionized workforces across sectors. And the school teacher unions have been battling since much earlier in the crisis to say, why should we and our members and children we teach be on the front line of risk around pandemic? So those two things together, kind of failure to address the public health risks and a kind of public face off battle with unionized school teachers, then kind of gets translated into these teachers, they're not teaching your kids anything they need to know. They're teaching them how to overthrow the state, if only. Now, I think for us, Left Book Club, and I think beyond in Pluto and across Left Publishing, we should really see this as an opportunity in which the cachet of the forbidden is kind of given to us. So instead of anti-capitalism feeling like, oh, no, not another dusty meeting. I don't think anyone goes to meetings anymore. I shouldn't say that, should I? Because we all long for the time when we could sit in long, boring meetings and see each other because we are all on Zoom. But 
that kind of um, mundane bureaucracy of the left kind of gets wiped away when the state says, this is a dangerous and prohibited thing. And at a time when people have such really very easy and quick access to information, a government prohibition on anti-capitalist thought seems like such a magical opportunity. They're giving people our language to search and people will be, will be searching it already as soon as they hear that's the banned thing. What do people do? They go and say, oh, why is that thing banned? <clears throat> I even kind of thought that actually if we were really, really smart, what we'd do is we'd make it slightly more difficult to find anti-capitalist resources as if you have to go through some code, you know, shake the hand of a secret doorman on the internet so that you have that kind of mystique, <laughs> let it make it, or don't make it too easy because it's prohibition that is bringing people to us. Um, but also um, to understand who the ban speaks to. The ban seems so overtly a call to the Tory base, you know, just not to the wider population, just to that small rung of people who the Tory party think they still need to speak to, who they, they rely on for their ongoing work. By November of this year, Oh, less than a year after you know that kind of celebrating of the election when they think they've trounced the left forever, only 26% of British adults who are polled um, feel agreeable towards the government. 56% are saying that they you know are disapproving of the government within 11 months of a kind of landslide election victory because of what's happened this year. So. Again, it's a performance that is not for the wider public. They're not even trying to persuade the wider British public. They just want to have some key kind of rabble rousing performances for their own people. And although there's no time to talk about it today, I hope we will talk in, a, in, an, in another session, the way in which um, the misuse of a fear of, of trans rights is similarly being used by the right in this country. I never thought I'd see the Conservative Party have any position on trans rights, but suddenly they also have this similar kind of um, rabble rousing thing about oh, trans activists uh, converting your children, anti-capitalists are converting your children. These are all inter the internal politics of the Conservative Party. They're not really about the broader population, certainly not the younger population. Because I think even they know which sensible person wouldn't be interested in learning about something that Boris Johnson wants to ban, or kind of fuzzy hair and Etonian bumbling. So what, what they're relying on is that their base will kind of feel like, oh, you're doing something. While on the other hand, I think it's an admission that they've lost that political ground amongst younger people. The one thing that I do think the ban plays to or kind of registers, but in a kind of slightly off, kind of off center way, is the extent to which a certain kind of set of anti-capitalist ideas seemingly has been everywhere in recent months in this country and perhaps beyond this country. That certainly um, the ways in which climate strike led by young people, mobilized by young people, absolutely kind of pushed the agenda around climate crisis in this country before um, Extinction Rebellion really, and it's the school strikers who moved that. That school striking movement is really overt in Britain in its kind of critique of global capitalism, about how you cannot address um, climate crisis without looking at the entrenched inequalities and Ill illogicality of global capitalist accumulation. That's a big deal. Not only you've got school kids out on the street every week, but they're kind of learning this critique of global inequality, of, of capitalist institutions, and linking it to our very survival. And of course, then Black Lives Matter builds on that. And again, I think I think it's hard to explain what an, a huge shift in consciousness of people across ethnic groups who are younger things like Black Lives Matter have had. Certainly in Britain, I think it's very hard to think that many younger people are not kind of alerted to what's going on with that. Partly, I think that's about a different awareness about what state violence is like, a different contact. 
doesn't mean that you yourself are brutalized, but an understanding of how people are brutalized and what re difference race means there. And so the anti-capitalist critique of Black Lives Matter also kind of reaches into the younger age range. And I did, forgot to write it down, but people probably know that when they did the polling of the last general election, which, you know, the terrible defeat of the left, oh, the Corbynistas, we all have to go away and, you know, with our tails between our legs. When they split it by age, if it was by a younger age range, there'd be hardly a seat in the country that wasn't taken by the Labour Party, the Corbyn-led Labour Party. So it's already been that generational shift in consciousness about what um, a quite well-informed, but also um, apt for our moment critique of capitalism is. And I'm hoping that when we speak to Kojo, he'll say some more things about that. So my last two things to say are, okay, given this context, that our enemies are giving us free publicity, rallying people to us, inadvertently recognizing that some of the topics that we wish to mobilize around and analyze are the topics of our time, why have more talk? And you know, if we're already winning the argument, why have more meetings? And I really have some sympathy with that about, oh, oh no, another meeting. But I think some of what we've learned about this moment of mobilization has been the extent to which people who are coming newly to activism, the people are out on the streets, are also absolutely eager to link ideas to why they're in the streets, partly in order to make connections across movements and bits of movements, and partly in order to build something beyond a slogan. And I think that's been very frightening to the political class. Not only anger, but um, quite deep analysis, not only a placard, but also a whole way of understanding why what happens in this police station here is linked to what happens to this trade deal here, is what happens to this flooded area here. That's a moment of opportunity for all of us who wish to talk about what a better world might be. And I think some of what we'd like to do in this series is like to make those connections. So that everyone who wants to know more to read new things and to hear new and old ideas can kind of have some spaces for us to be with each other because communing together is also part of how we kind of rebuild ourselves for the moments outside. <clears throat> and I don't think it is a replacement for being on the streets because I think that argument happens all the time. But I do think even the conversations we have remotely like this can be a way of us rebuilding our connections to each other. And that's kind of a resource. It's a way of building our shared resource because our connections to each other and our ability to hear and hear each other and muse on what has been said and to kind of retrieve that back into our own sense of agency. You know, that's, that's part of our business because otherwise you're alone, aren't you? So, you know, I still think that the right kind of chat can help to make other things possible because the chat is it's not contained. It's like, it becomes part of me and what I might do next. So if I had a slide, now I'd say, in praise of the class snuggle, which I would like to be my, of the many things, I'm gonna have to have a really big um, tombstone, but somewhere on it, it should say in praise of the class. Okay. Right, sorry about that. You can see the state only cares when we talk about caring for each other. Snuggle, that's the real revolutionary word. That's their trigger word when they come and say, oh, stop them now, they're talking about snuggling. But the class snuggle, you know, which is meant to be a cuddle and a holding, is I still think a kind of apt phrase for this time, which has been the harshest of all times, when still just the basic access to the means of life been taken from so many people and we're still in the beginning of that process that we've all been living through isolation illness loss grief upon grief even if that grief is not new and so despite of course the limitations of the online meeting we really hope that these events also contribute to rebuilding a sense of some communal space of, of not being alone of being with others to find a kind of way of talking to capitalism that is still surprising you kind of think, oh yeah, I never thought of that. But it's hospitable, not somewhere where you come for a fight, but where you come to be held. 
and to take something back away with you that will sustain you for other times. Because really, for all of us who wish for a better world, we need to say to each other every day that we are our most important resource, the most central resource of any movement. And it is we who are the other side fears most of all. We, we together in our snuggle or arrangement or solidarity. So how we're able to sustain each other, that's also part of the struggle. And the talk is part of that. So on which note, I should move my screen and get to talk to my good friend and adopted family member, Kojo Karam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that, Kagi. That was, that was everything I didn't know that I wanted. The, to be invited into the class snuggle is, is really what I've been waiting for over this, um, over this pandemic period. So thank you, and yeah, for everything that you said. Oh, thanks so much. So I wondered if, um, you know, to invite you to maybe if you could say a bit more about why you think we've come to this moment of official condemnation and attempt to ban anti-capitalist thought here. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. And um, I think really springing off, um, yeah, that fantastic introduction that you mentioned, I think that you really, you really touched upon the, the kind of key driver behind this attempt to, um, you know, impose state-backed restriction upon the discussion of anti-capitalist ideas within uh, particularly school classrooms. And it is related to the kind of generational cleavage that's being opened up within the, um, the social makeup of not only the United Kingdom, but across a lot of the Western world. Um, you know, you mentioned the 2019 election, which of course, in terms of its kind of um, ultimate consequences was was a was a was a major victory for the Conservative Party, but of course it seemed like a, a victory that was um, statute limited in terms of it's due to expire at a particular point because of that division between the generations. And when we look at the the, the drift leftward of the generations that has been um, you know really kind of um, explored and articulated by people like Keir Milburn and in their work and and this isn't just something that's a specifically UK phenomenon we see this phenomenon repeated within the United States um, within a lot of the other major um, Western um, jurisdictions and it's not part of this overall narrative of well you know people are young and naive and they're lefty when they're young and then they get a little bit of experience in the world and a little bit of actual understanding of how things work and they turn into reactionary conservatives. Um, as Milburn's identified in 1983, the Tories actually won the 18 to 13 vote. Um, Margaret Thatcher was actually um, victorious within that demographic over Labour. Um, the change within the political orientation of that generation is linked to material changes within the structure of capitalism. And the idea that these people are gonna transition into being reactionary conservatives is not automatic. It's something that is usually um, facilitated by the attainment of the investments within a capitalist system of secure employment, of property. These are the things that allow for that transition or have allowed for that tradition historically since universal suffrage of people into um, more conservative older figures. And that is being broken in very crude terms by the kind of long arc of neoliberalism that is now bending towards the very imperial metropole through the very heart of empire now. And so, you know, the, 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 there has to be some attempt to try and um, restrict people from gaining the language to be able to articulate the frustrations that they're going to be encountering on a much more acute basis than their parents were. Um, you know, then this is a large driver of the entire Brexit debate. Um, you know, we're going to be um, told the Brexit is all about national sovereignty. But I think, you know, as we're finding out now, there's going to be a lot of nationalism, but very little sovereignty, however you want to broadly define it. You know, we're going to have um, the attempt to provide the psychic wages of kind of national superiority 
in replacement for the um, failure of actually allowing people to sustain themselves and actually meet their material conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that the restriction of allowing the discussion of capitalism within the school sphere um, is, a, is an early attempt to try and drive people towards that politics of resentment and xenophobia over against actually gaining a language to understand their material conditions. No, I, I think you've put that really so aptly, scarily, but very aptly. And I think anyone listening from outside Britain really needs to hear what, what you've just said, because I think people who, who have not been here don't really understand how quickly that whole um, move to there being nothing but a kind of fantasy wage of, of Britishness, how quickly that has become centre stage. Um, you touched a bit on um, the silencing of what it means for the, for this kind of fissure to come to the imperial metropole, but um, I know that some you know some of the ways we know each other has been through work which tries to critique colonialism and empire. And I wondered if you thought that there was anything in an attempt to demonise those critiques within this ban as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, in the same kind of moment in which um, the Conservative Party were talking about the banning of, of conversations around capitalism within schools, they were also talking about the, com the banning of conversations around, you know, what they described as critical race theory, but of course, um, without any definition of what critical race theory might be, it wasn't like, here's the list of texts by Derek Bell, you know, <laughs> Kimberly Crenshaw that we don't know, it's like any discussion really about colonialism, decolonization, whiteness, blackness, empire, um, you know, post-empire, all of those is critical race theory and those shouldn't be discussed. And I think that, you know, when we, you know, when we return back to that moment that you left us with within your talk of this expansion of consciousness through the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer period, um, the, the, the iconic scene of that era, the, the you know, the kind of framed, um, photograph that, you know, maybe in future years might start to, you know, become that kind of iconic thing that, you know, students put on their walls or whatever, is the um, throwing of the Edward Colson statue into the Bristol Harbour and the pulling down by a multiracial, in fact, probably majority um, white collection of young people of this um, representation of, um, uh, of, yeah, not just um, a, uh, a, an individual who was a slave, or as he was described, which he obviously was, being the director, one of the directors of the Royal African Company, but also someone who tells us a specific history about capitalist corporatism within Britain. You know, when we think about the Royal African Company and we learn about that, then we start to see how capitalism has been incredibly embedded with the project of um, racial, um, exploitation and imperial domination. Um, it's not just the Royal African Company, of course, it's the Hudson Bay Company, of course, it's the um, Royal Niger Company, of course, perhaps most prominently, the East India Company. And so much of the, um, the kind of uh, rhetoric that is supposed to elevate the corporate body as the main institution of wealth production is undermined when we actually look at its origins, when we look at the extent to which the, 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 the corporate form really transitions into a commercial entity through the colonial project in close collaboration with the state, being given monopolies, which is essentially what these, the, these companies were, you know, they were given monopolies in order to facilitate colonial exploitation. And that's the first thing that really makes the corporation a commercial entity. Before that, corporations are like universities and churches, and it's through empire that we get corporate a commercialism and um, an understanding of that, I think not only, yeah, deconstructs our ideas around, around empire, it also deconstructs our ideas around capitalism. And I think that was a part of the great pushback against, you know, interrogating Edward Colston and his legacy and, oh, you know, he, what he did was a long time ago and, you know, none of us think about things like that now. And, you know, why don't we just leave it in there? He was a great philanthropist. Look at the nice hall that he built there in, in Bristol, you know, this hasn't got anything to do with us today. None of us would defend slavery, is what you might hear on um, on um, the uh, talk radio shows. But a lot of people would defend the trajectory 
of corporate capitalism that the Royal African Company really embodies. Um, and I think that's what's really the value of thinking about that. No, I, I love how you describe that. And it's just so insightful of what's going on, because as you say, Britain, along with plenty of other places, has had a whole rhetoric of like, oh, but capitalism is such a good thing of look, you know, look at the shopping, look at the progress, you know, that, that's kind of still in, in the air since Thatcher, but mm -hmm. not let's look at the blood, let's look at the bodies, then it becomes a different kind of story to have a conversation about. Yeah, I'm really that's... pleased to hear, you. oh, sorry, did you want to say something? No, no, no I just said, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, I really love that you talked about the, the, the form of the corporation and how deeply imperial the form of the corporation is. But, I mean, we've had this conversation before that I certainly think that people can still now, even with this consciousness about what kind of beast capitalism is, be a bit nervous about economics talk, that even when you use those words like the, the corporate form and things, people get a bit anxious. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about what anti-capitalists could or should be doing to try and help people feel confident about talking about economics, which is such a kind of mysterious entity. And that, and that sense of mystery is part of how we're kept out of it, isn't it? That kind of, oh, let the experts deal with that. You think, oh, well, what could we do to help? And I think absolutely, you know, the, the, um, the real development of economics as an academic discipline over the last 30, 40 years has been to try and contain and restrain ideas of knowledge around the, um, the, the, the global economy within this specialist kind of discipline. The idea that yet yeah, only those um, kind of educated and familiar with the language should be able to engage in these particular discussions. And of course, you know, I do think that there is a great role for the reading and the discussion and the education and you know um, of course that stuff expands your ability to interpret the experiences that you encounter but um, you know way before I ever you know read a book on Marx or Gramsci or um, you know any Fanon or any of the, the great thinkers of the global economy um, you start to gain an, an experience and an understanding of the way in which these structures of exploitation function. Um, you know, my first experience and understanding really of kind of labor value theory and, you know, how the, the, the relationship between um, the wage labor that you receive and the profit that the capitalist enjoys, how the connection between them wasn't through reading Marx, it was through um, the first job that I got at Debenhams. <laughs> um, yeah, which has now gone out of business, um, which um, I have a, I have a, a, um, a, a nuanced relationship too, you know, I obviously feel sad about the thousands, thousands of people who've lost their jobs, but also they paid me about, you know, I think it was about 290 an hour because I was just turned 16 and um, that was um, all that I could command uh, for my wage at that time. And, you know, when you're working in those kind of um, roles and you're having a relationship between, well, how much am I getting paid and how many shirts am I selling here? And how much is that? Okay, there seems to be quite a significant gap in between those. And um, I think that that experience is the foundation through which you can start to engage people in conversations and discussions around um, the economy. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the kind of the, the quote that, that is probably worth us wrestling with from a left perspective, but one that has been unfortunately very successful is um, the Thatcher quote of, you know, economics of the methods but the objective is to change the soul, to change the value system, to change the very um, the, the, the very desires of individuals, to, to, to detach them from, from investments in concepts such as community, concepts such as solidarity, and to, very, to, to, to instill in them this, this investment in individualism and in accumulation in realizing self-actualization through wealth, um, you know, it's not it's not to talk about economy all the time it's not to talk about um you know the big bang and um joint stock companies and you know the establishment of offshore jurisdictions and that stuff that all happened through the kind of great neoliberal um post-imperial project of britain but the goal was to get people to think about you know um yeah the their ideas about you know 
self-reliance and hard work and you know all these things that appear to be almost moral or ethical issues and to very much change their individual soul and um you know i think that you know we might want to think about trying to do similar things on the left you know you don't have to use um yeah doctrinal ideas and kind of elite academic terminology in order to engage people on their experience and on that emotional experience of having to try and you know find sustenance within this economy no that's that really leads on to the next thing i hope we've talked about you know you've already heard me say here and you've probably heard me hear, say it before because i always say things like this that i think that when um especially quite unglamorous and unlikable enemies come to attack you it's kind of an opportunity so if someone like Boris Johnson or you know, Michael Gove says, who are the kind of most unlikable creatures you could imagine, say, oh, look at them. We should think that of that as a kind of propaganda opportunity, that they are using the vehicles of the state to popularise our language. And they're not great marketers themselves. So it's kind of an opening for us. But I wondered if you had any ideas, you've started to say a bit about it just there, but any any more that you wanted to build on, on how we should use this moment of kind of opening when suddenly there are new eyes on the world of anti-capitalist thought, that what kinds of things should we be propagating or how should we best make use of this opportunity when there's suddenly interest in what we do? Um, I think the opportunities are multifaceted. It's not just interest due to the kind of demonization and opposition from the Conservative Party and from, you know, this and this is a, a kind of global anti-capitalist stroke white supremacist movement. There is, of course, shared conversations between the kind of Trump reactionary right in America, Bolsonaro right within um, Brazil. Um, a lot of these places are share of the similar rhetoric and what we're seeing here within, within um, the United Kingdom. But it's also, you know, um, spaces for critiques of capitalism that are being opened up by like you mentioned in your introduction, the impact that the pandemic is having upon people's lives and the acceleration of the divergence between living conditions and life opportunities between those who have access to assets and those who have to work and actually endeavor for their, for their survival. Essentially the difference between proletariats and your capitalists. And you're seeing that incredibly starkly during this pandemic where, you know, Jeff Bessel, Jeff Bessels is, and um, you know a lot of your tech entrepreneurs can't stop making money even whilst people have their livelihoods taken away and sometimes even their lives taken away because they had to keep working because they had to turn up to a job and um, undertake that personal risk um, to them and their family because without that wage they wouldn't be able to make it to the next month. I think that's opened up a lot of opportunities for people to really. Um, try and consider how can we reframe this global economy um, once everything has restarted. And I think that a fear that really underpins this demonization of anti-capitalism is the fact that a lot of it, when not framed as Marxism, not when framed as like anti-capitalism, but when framed in kind of, um, you know, stark material terms, is actually incredibly popular. Um, a, 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 a kind of telling example will be the um, recent um, across many different areas, but within many different countries, but within the United Kingdom, I'll, I'll just give the statistics of that. 82% um, of Britons argued that companies who are registered in offshore tax havens shouldn't be included in any potential collective bailouts for the coronavirus. The idea that we need to reframe um, this system of um, globalized free market capitalism, which allows um, companies to be able to dip in and out of jurisdictions, you know, almost like they're in a shopping mall, there's an understanding for almost everybody that this does not in any way improve my life. This is not something that contributes towards my life. Um, the way in which debt has been used and is about to be used again, the rhetoric of you know, we've built up this unsustainable debt. And so therefore we need to um, privatize public services, um, impose further taxes upon um, working people, impose the public sector pay freeze um, to ensure that, you know, the people who've sacrificed often their lives in the pandemic are also suffering in the recovery. I think a lot of people recognize that this, as they recognize in the third world debt crisis um, in the global South, as, you know, perhaps before anybody else, 
as they recognize in the austerity uh, moment kind of post 2008, people are realizing that this kind of rhetoric is damaging to the vast majority of people's lives and they are incredibly unpopular. And I think we're about to enter another moment where that rhetoric is about to be, yeah, um, mobilized again in order to drive through neoliberal reforms. And um, I think that to make the best of this opportunity would be to really, you know, cohere people around the injustice of this of the of this kind of yeah global capitalist structure. No, and I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, I guess moving on from that a bit, and I think both you and I just touched on it a little bit. That is it helpful for us to understand this kind of attack by the state as a kind of culture war and a distraction for us as well as for them. Because you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit worried about that, about how much we respond to the attacks of the, the state. And also, you know, I just feel a bit confused by it really, that you know, clearly some of the things that are going on are culture war-ish kinds of things, aren't they? The stuff around the legacy of empire, the stuff about whether or not anyone's singing Land of Hope and Glory, the stuff around trans rights, these are all kind of pretty kind of overt culture war kind of triggers. Yeah. I'm much less certain about the overt attack on anti-capitalist thought. And I wondered if you had any ideas about, is this part of the so-called culture war or is it a, a, a different technique? I mean, I think it is definitely trying to be used as part of a culture war and trying to present the idea that um, any kind of criticism of kind of capitalist structures of accumulation, both historically and contemporary, and in the contemporary, are somehow an attack on Britain or attack on your identity or an attack on kind of national pride. Um, you know, so I think the Tories are trying to do that. And so there is this kind of, yeah, relationship, you know, whenever they talk about, you know, why Black Lives Matter are evil, they'll be like, because they're a Marxist organization without any kind of explanation of what Marxism is, but just, just to remind you, if you're watching at home, that if you hear anybody talking about Marxism, this is bad, this means that, you know, you want to dig up Winston Churchill's bones and, desecrate them <laughs> like this is um the the end yeah, this is the the kind of moral panic that you mentioned um within your your presentation um but i think that they where where where, where it where we don't want to fall into the trap is to respond to that kind of sensationalist aspect of the culture wars and you know the examples that you gave you know are people going to sing land of hope and glory or will britannia you know around and this is this is made as, a, as an attempt to short circuit to people's kind of base national um, responses in order to try and generate a, 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 yeah, a, a, a kind of, yeah, an angry condemnation towards what could be a much wider and much more substantive argument. Mm -hmm. I think where we do want to kind of push back on a thing which is a place that um, is in great concern, I think, for those who are in authority, is the way in which the two elements can be connected, you know, the kind of imperial critique and the critique around the structures and machinery of capitalist accumulation are embedded. You know, I think there's a, they're happy to talk all day about do we sing Royal Britannia at um at um you know the Royal Proms or whatever it's called. I'm not too familiar, but whatever it's called, it's yeah. Do we sing Royal Britannia there? They're a lot le um, less happy to talk about um, why is it the, the vast majority of the world's major tax havens are actually British overseas territories that maintain a jurisdictional relationship to not only the British state, but the British crown specifically through its um, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. They don't want to talk about that. You know, they don't want to talk about the idea that Britain could, through its legal avenues, actually make massive steps to close down the offshoring of wealth that has really gutted the ability for popular democracy to hold multinational corporations to account all over the world, including the United Kingdom. That part of empire, I don't think is, is, is a culture war. I think that's part of something they don't want to discuss. I think it's, I think you still got your mute on. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, I didn't unmute. No. No, absolutely. I mean, I was going to ask you another question about excitement. But I think we've both talked about excitement. And I wonder if it's better for people to have questions and then we can talk excitedly about them at this point, because we've covered quite a lot of the ground that we, you know, I hope that you'd cover and you've covered it so well. So I'm looking at 
my colleagues and the small boxes up on my screen to see if it's time to start doing that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Clap. Let's do a virtual clap. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kojo, Gargi. I think many people's minds are very, um, well, in, I'm, so, I'm sure some people's minds are blown, but also some people's minds are re awakened in some ways especially in terms of alternatives now we do have some really good questions so i think i'll fire away at the questions first and then if there's anything else that um you we may want to discuss if we have some more time um we can also do that um so there's a few kind of um more um I suppose non-discussion questions, or perhaps they can be discussion. I don't know. Um, there's someone asked, "Is there a UK book on uh, critical race theory that could be recommended?" That's the first question. And I suppose, yeah, I suppose if you do have recommendation, perhaps you could also, you know, talk about why you would recommend that book. Oh, I think that's all really tricky. I mean. I think it's strange, critical race theory is being demonized by the state here. But as Kojo kind of alluded to, I'm not sure that many people, scholars of racism in this country, necessarily use that framework. And the colleagues I know who use it are almost exclusively working in the field of education studies. That even, I don't even know lots of legal studies people here, although the people in the States tend to be mainly, you know, a lot of them are legal studies people. So I'm not sure so I can't tell whether that question is saying, is there good stuff to read about race in Britain? Or if it's really saying, do people do CRT in Britain? So, I th so if, I, if it was the first, um, actually, of course, I'd, I'd say read some of the work of you know, Kojo's edited collection on um, the war on drugs, read Luke um, de Narona's, um book on deporting black Britons, um, read Paul Gilroy's work throughout his lifetime, read older stuff from Sivanandan and Stuart Hall if you want to see the particular histories of analysing racism in this country. But the more precise question of critical race theory in this country, I can't immediately pull a, a book length piece to mind, I'm afraid. It's a bit of a weakness on my part, I'm sorry. No, no, I don't think it is at all. I think that it, you know, it speaks to the way in which the um, representation of critical race theory within the kind of popular discourse has been wholly divorced from the reality of what critical race theory is in Britain, which is that this, this is an academic tradition that has a specific history and that is very much tied to um, the American legal response to the insufficiencies of kind of civil rights legislation. You know, Derek Bell, Patricia Williams, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, you know, um, this is what critical race theory is, Sherelle Harris. Um, and then now, like you do go online or you hear Tory ministers talking about it and they're like, everyone, these critical race theorists are demonizing and terrifying. Um, you know, um, what they really mean is any conversation about race that makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, I've got a friend of mine who was in school, and um, this is then this is and this is when you know when we talk about it not being a culture war and something that is actually quite sinister for me to respond to. Um, he described how discussions around Othello were being told to not do that in a way that draws in critical race theory, and he's like, "What does that mean? Does that mean to try and discuss Othello without talking about race? Because that's going to be pretty hard, you know." And the same with anti-capitalism. You know, it doesn't have to be reading Marx. It's all of a sudden now is a discussion of, you know, Porsche's critique of debt in Merchant of Venice. Is that anti-capitalist thought that should be banned? Or, you know, all of the kind of canonical quintessential English texts, you know, Charles, da Charles Dickens's critique of industrialism in hard times or our mutual friend. Is that anti-capitalism? Should that be banned? Um, yeah, I don't think any of the people who are talking about critical race theory in the public media at the moment have any idea what it means. And I'd actually like to ask them if I could be bothered to go on a TV show and actually argue with them. I think the first thing I'd say is just go, what are your, what is the main three critical race theory books that you're referring to here? Name me an author. 
because you guarantee that I have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, thank you very much for that response. Um, so uh, w- one of the questions that came through, I, I do think, of course, this is the point of this introduction episode, but I'll um, ask anyway. So though, I think they, I think the question is more about kind of the specific motivations around why the state is target, targeting anti-capitalist education today. And there was another question, which I think is related to, I'll ask it now as well, and I love it. <laughs> it says, so is it literally that the state doesn't want children to have the tools to think critically about the world they are growing up in? So fire away. Yes, that's obviously a question <laughs> from a school teacher who knows perfectly well what they're asking. <laughs> but, um... I mean, people who know something about the British school system will know that, sadly, even before this overt attack, there are different ways in which um, schools' hands have been tied to try and limit how much um, critical purchase young people can have on their experiences, whether it's their experiences of their own bodies or their experiences of their environment. But Britain, sadly, seems to have had a, a rollback from a moment, maybe... Um, 25 or 30 years ago when school teacher organizing very much mobilized about what was taught the state's response to the national curriculum and since then has very much kind of limit and say oh well you can't teach this you can't teach that and certainly you can't teach anything that might empower you of course people always learn some things that empower them one way or another but um but i do think it's an active an attempt to say school's not about thinking which actually i find more frightening even than the left bashing, for, the, for, for our government to so overtly be happy to say that my cheerleading thing is, yes, whoever told you school was about thinking, that's a bit that chills my blood, actually, rather than the particular naming of anti-capitalism, because that feels like that is the end of the wedge. That is a kind of, you know, we've seen that in other moments and other places, and that you pick the thing that you think is the soft target in order to start le- kind of to close down the spaces in which people can talk about any anything much but I think it was probably a facetious question wasn't it which is fine I love a facetious question I'm a great master of the facetious question myself so I'm doing all the talking you should say things as well um oh, is, is that me? Is that yes me? Yeah. would you um, like to try and answer that question yeah I mean I think you know, Gargi's answer was wonderful. And I, I can only add to that, but the only thing I, I want to also stress is that it's stopping particular kids from trying to learn and understand the world, you know, in terms of, you know, the thing that, again, is a legacy of Britain's imperial history and divided social context is that more than almost anywhere else within Europe, we have a markedly divided education system. And, you know, if you're willing to pay I think it's like £30,000 a year to send your kid to Eton or one of these other boarding schools, then you will have the opportunity to try and understand critically um, the world that you exist in. You will get a chance to read not just an Adam Smith or a David Ricardo, but probably a bit of Karl Marx as well. So you have a little bit of a language about the economy, but it's about, you know, people um, across the country who don't have that 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 level of, yeah, um, fortune I know, I know some people will consider it not the greatest fortune to have to end up in one of those boarding schools but if you don't have that opportunity then yeah you're, you're not supposed to be learning critically about the world you're supposed to be trained um to 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 to, to work a job and that job isn't going to exist as well by the time you probably are in position to work here thank you very much um so we have a another question um the NEU Black Educators Network pointed towards the link between the success of uh, decolonizing the curriculum uh, projects and I suppose attempts after BLM and the new rule on anti-capitalist education. What do you think about this? Uh, can you discuss this a little? Why don't you go first this time, Kojo, so I don't talk so much. Sure, okay. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, this the... the the um the recent you know ban on discussions on capitalism or you know race unless put in unless it's put into conversation about somebody else you know which is a really interesting way for a state minister to discuss um you know essentially what you know my understanding of censorship is 
of course, thinking about it etymologically, that it's tied to state power, that it's tied to the state, um, you know, in terms of the Roman census and the ability to decide who does and doesn't include themselves in the population, you know, that censorship, but uh, all of the free speech union, all of the defense against, you know, um, snowflake lefties and trans activists censoring everybody, they have been, you know, markedly silent on this act of censorship. And I think that part of it is really driven by this longer history of trying to, you know, challenge um, the structures that determine our institutions of education, um, going all the way back to at least the Rose Must Fall movement that, you know, following its success in South Africa, you know, really confronted the very heart of the British education system, the University of Oxford, you know, where every other prime minister has, has passed through. Um, I think that that um, kind of moment tied in with a broader attempt to try and reframe um, what is the terrain of legitimate academic inquiry. And again, this isn't, this isn't, you know, there's all this kind of newspaper headlines of all of a sudden now nobody can read Shakespeare anymore and everybody's going to be, you know, force fed Tanahisi coats, you know, for your literature. Like that's, you know, what's going to be an English literature degrees. And the reality is that people are looking for an expansion of knowledge, not just a replacement of knowledge, you know, we're talking about, yes, do put, you know, a William Shakespeare in conversation with a James Baldwin or a Toni Morrison, and maybe that might reframe the way that you understand things like The Tempest, you know, in the way that, you know, read that Shakespeare's Tempest along with Amy Césaire's rewriting of Tempest, you know, read um, Tyson Andronicus and look at the racial elements of that, you know, there is, there is, there is, um, a real attempt at, I think, yeah, quite a nefarious censorship and closing down of legitimate knowledge inquiry and legitimate ways of engaging in spaces of knowledge, which is quite, yeah, you know, quite, quite sinister at the moment and is one that is amazingly ignored by the, um, the free speech warriors of the, um, of the kind of, yeah, commentariat rights. Yeah, I mean, would you... I, mean, I mean, the only thing I was going to, you know, I can hardly add to that, but the only thing I was going to add is just, again, I mean, Coach has already said it, that these attempts to shut down are not, are not really saying, and then all UK children have access to the broad histories of Western liberal education. No, it's not that either. It's just learn less. Don't learn what you want to learn. Don't learn about your own histories and don't learn about our histories either. Just know your place. So I think this is all part of that kind of grad grindist model of education, which sadly never quite went away in Britain. And in these hard times, everything is that Dickens at the moment. It's kind of, of course, it's, it's much more prevalent, isn't it? Just one final thing as well I thought I wanted to, to add to that is, um, a lot of the closing down of the discussions, particularly closing down on the way that capitalism and race work together, is being argued for on the basis that, well, it makes people feel bad, you know what I mean? You know, your um, the, the kind of defense of the white working class, actually, it's white working class boys who are doing the worst, and they are being made to, to be demonized and feel terrible about themselves if you discuss things like the history of capitalism or the history of race. And I think you know, this might be me being overly optimistic, but I'm trying to find some hope and I find some hope in the young. I think that the, the, um, the images of the summer protests, what they actually showed, and this is what they are terrified about, is that if you teach a class on the history of race and capitalism within Britain, your young white children, you know, in these red wall cities, don't get upset, they get angry. They actually don't like the fact that their best friend who was black might be stopped and searched more than them. It actually um, produces a different response than the response that those who try to represent them seem to claim. And I think that's what they're really, really worried about, that by teaching this, you actually might be creating new, new, new boundaries of solidarity or new linkages of solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kojo. Um, I mean, I think the next question kind of goes quite easily, um, continues quite easily from what you just said. Um, and uh, so the question is, what should our strategy be? And especially when resisting crackdowns on anti-racism, anti-capitalism and education, should we use free speech? 
speech framings or does that miss the point and reinforce the idea of free speech as supposedly neutral? Um, I'm Koji, do you want to start on that as well? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the reality is that anyone who is coming from a um, engagement with kind of anti-racist either organizing or ideas or anti-capitalist um, organizing ideas understands that, you know, kind of liberal platitudes like free speech are embedded within histories of, of, of politics and contestation. And we can't, we can't simply hope that an appeal to these kind of universal um, frameworks will therefore realize a, um, a change in the material circumstances. But I think it can be mentioned just as, a, as an identification of the hypocrisy of, of these individuals. You know, I think that, you know, again, I'll repeat myself, but um, all these free speech warriors that, you know, your writers have spiked and the spectator like to claim themselves as being in the lineage of, you know, George Orwell, they'll always draw out and be like, you know, George Orwell did this or Alexander Solzhenitsky and stuff like that. These people stood up against state power. Yeah. If you're a free speech warrior and you've had nothing to say about state power, about prevent, about, you know, these recent bans on anti-capitalism or race, then you are not a free speech warrior attacking, you know, um, people on, on the internet um, who, you know, might be, you know, migrant communities on the internet is not the same as being a free speech warrior. <laughs> and so whilst not um, kind of over investing in those rhetorics, I think that, you know, if we do find ourselves in, in kind of confrontation with those, I think that that's a fantastic opportunity to really kind of expose that hypocrisy and to say that, you know, if you're lining up behind a conservative minister who is using the instruments of state to ban the discussion of ideas within classrooms, you know, that is not a great free speech warrior make. No, I mean, I guess the one thing that makes me slightly anxious, which I guess is within the framing of, is it a kind of concocted culture war, is that even though I think it's an opportunity, the way in which the attack happens also seems to me designed to shape our response so that they, they frame it as speech and then we must respond by our right to speech, which I think is built into the question. Whereas really, I think, firstly, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that teaching analytic frameworks are the same as a kind of the right to make a speech, that it's not just simply a speech act, it's, it's something a kind of a bit more texture than that. So there's, there's talking, there's reading, there's sharing, there's doing, that it's kind of a, a bigger sensibility and that learning and it both reduces learning and schooling to listen to me talk, know your place and listen, but and it also reduces our response to no, 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 you saying I can't say that, I will say that. So I, so I kind of feel, you know, I guess it's just my, my preference to think maybe a little bit of energy of saying, yes, you say I can't, this is banned, I'm saying it's not banned but also maybe a bigger part of energy of, well, what is it to create an educational environment which is informed by um, the traditions and thoughts and practices of, of anti-capitalism of different kinds, which I hope we'll talk about through the series, because practice is, practice is harder to kind of ban and silence than I read this and wrote and said it to you, shut up, I'm, take your notes. You know, practice is a different mode, I think, and I can't, and I feel like it's kind of the what mode of the attack is a little bit to distract us from a more something which is bigger than just a book on a curriculum or a speech in a lecture theatre, but something which is a, has many more aspects to it. And I hope that some of what we might talk together about here in this series, but just across our shared political spaces might be to think about that as well, that the opportunity is to say, yeah, read this book, but also look at this whole way of being, look at this way of being with others. Because, you know, we're more than some good bits of writing. We've got some good bits of writing as well, but that's only, you know, that's just the icing really, isn't it, of what our whole collectivity is about. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, answers. I mean, on that, on that note, I suppose, um, 
do you think or should anti-capitalist teaching be framed around the discussion of revolutionary politics? Do you think that is the way to perhaps discuss it? Ooh. Right. Well, this would depend on what we mean by revolutionary politics, wouldn't it? Which I'll get so overexcited, then we won't be able to stop today if we start that. So I think the state thinks that we imagine anti-capitalism in an absolutely state-focused way and that we are the people who want to smash the state. I'd like to just reaffirm that I am one of the people who want to smash the state, but once again, that is only the smallest of my aspirations. I want to remake the universe and remake our lives so that they are the most beautiful and kind of exuberant and delicious things that they could possibly be. Smashing the state is just a small kind of hurdle on the way to this bigger endeavour, which is for all of us. So I think there is something about reframing what revolutionary thought is in the small and the big ways and the different traditions, which include prefiguring something here, but also building a mass movement there. Debates between different global locations about what um, an indigenous anti-capitalism might be against a kind of state-led anti-capitalism in the North. All of that, I think, is part of what our communing together must be. So even to act as if there is a kind of oh, one revolutionary purpose, that feels a bit like you, you let the other side choose, choose the dance track and choose the menu. It's not theirs to choose. It's, that, it's ours, isn't it? Oh, you see, that's bad. That gets me really overexcited. I have to calm down. <laughs> uh, Koji, do you want to come on that? Um, no, just that I'll, I'm, I'm following Gargan to wherever wherever she's leading to yeah try and think through and put into practice new ways of being together i think that's great i mean thank you very much um i also join you on the aspirations of remaking the universe i absolutely think we should not be aiming for anything less so thank you very much for bringing that into this discussion um we i mean i suppose in some ways as a continuation of um, the previous question, uh, someone's asked, how do you feel about the term anti-capitalist? Is it a term named as an, op uh, it's a term named as an opposition to capitalism instead? Um, or would it be better if it was in favor of something, um, you know, that would describe a politics? So I suppose it's kind of a bit of a continuation of what you've just been saying, Gargi, but also perhaps Kojo, you can come back on this as well. I mean, I think it's a really insightful question, you know, the idea of, you know, are we conceptualizing ourselves in negative terms and therefore kind of reifying the omnipotence of capitalism as, uh, as, as a moment? Um, you know, I think, I think, well, you know, one thing that I find really useful um, of the kind of educational element of the kind of anti-capitalist, you know, reading and writing and talking and discussing and laughing that we've we've done together is the way it historicizes capitalism. I think that you get the experience of the exploitative, um, both um, materially and psychic elements of capitalism um, through the participation in the global economy at whatever level that you're at, you get a certain sense of that exploitation, but to actually historicize it as an economic form of distributing material goods around the world that had a beginning and that will have an end, you know, you, that allows you to be able to, I think, critique it in a way that, um, yeah, dismisses the the kind of the lazy um, rebuttals of, uh, oh, I see you, did, you know, arguing against capitalism, and yet I saw you drinking a Starbucks coffee the other day, or you're using an Apple map. So how can you do that if you're against capitalism? Anything that's ever happened in the history of the world is the result of capitalism. And you're just like, this is, this is, this is laughable when you do think about it as a historical contingent economic model, you know, in the same way, you know, if it was speak to a, you know, 12th century um, feudal peasant and be like, I see you critiquing feudalism, but yeah, you're eating the parsnips that have been provided to you by your Lord. How can you critique feudalism when it's giving you everything that you have? Um, I think that that's the, you know, one of the useful things of thinking about um, anti-capitalism um, is that, you know, just to try and contain and historicize and close it within its particular historical borders. Um, and I think that, that can be done without 
you know, giving all the answers to what the world to be might come. That's something that will come through, you know, exploration and and discovery and play that's going to be produced in and of itself you don't have to give that a name you don't have to give that you know a set of text that is going to you know like the kind of scrolls from the temple of mount from temple of mount sinai that tell you you know how we're going to live in the future non-capitalist world you just have to be like this is capitalism it's a system that had a beginning and that will have an end and then i'm against that system i think that's still useful no, absolutely. That's beautifully put. And that's partly what I wanted to say as well, that although, of course, there are all kinds of people, including probably us in different incarnations, who try and put forward what a better alternative would be, to start with the solution that limits who you're having the conversation with. And we want to have a conversation with everyone who thinks this is not good enough, not good enough for me, not good enough for the people I love, not good enough for the people I don't know yet. So the first is the no, you know, that, um, you know, I've forgotten that it's in crack capitalism, isn't it? You know, that first is the collective no, that not this, this cannot do it. And that we might come from different analyses and traditions, but the first is that this is not good enough for any of us. And that that brings us to the room together, I think. And I think that, I, I like, that's what being hospitable means, I think. If you start with your answer, it's not quite hospitable enough because people have to agree with your answer to come in the room with you. Whereas if we start with our shared aspiration for something better, then as Kojo says, you know, that discovery, play, being in commune with each other, that's, that's how the new world could be glimpsed. But you know, we hope, I hope. Uh, I mean, thank you very much for those responses. Um, I think that as the last question, you know, a lot has been, of course, a lot of ground as expected has been covered throughout, you know, both of your interventions, uh, Gargi and Kojo. And I think one of the, I suppose, running themes has been that the, in some ways, the importance of discussing and understanding um, what party political is and and ideal and ideological stance and how some how sometimes they relate to each other but can be different and you know Kojo you spoke about the um, the kind of the one of the motivations or reasons for why anti-capitalist uh, education material may be being banned is the Tory government knows that there may be an expiration date so that because because so therefore due to ideological loyalty some things have to be achieved in quite a quick way I think especially in um, especially amongst the left in the UK and particularly after you know in some ways the understandable disappointment many people felt after we didn't get a Corbyn government I think the discussion around in some ways a difference between um, you know political party political political class but also ideological um, grounding I think there needs to be a bit a bit more of a detailed and important discussion about that. Can you say, I know you can't, I know that that would be a whole thing within itself, but can you speak to that a little bit? Um, I'll let Gargi go first so I could learn from her and parachute, piggyback off whatever wonderful insight she has. Oh, that's cheeky. That's a question explicitly to you. <laughs> <laughs> Was it explicitly to me? Oh, sorry. I... It's no, no. It's to both of you, but of course, I mean, yeah. You really want me to start? I can try and start if you want, or do you want to? No, no. I, I, I can, I can. I you can. go on. So, um, if I could just, yeah, I guess recap that um, the, you know, what I describe as the kind of driver for anti-capitalism being this attempt to try and cohere together a younger generation around um, a psychic investment, knowing that they're not gonna transition into conservatives through the material investments that the usual pathway of transforming younger people into conservatives. Um, so, um, and then the, the um, so what, what was the second half of that you wanted me to respond to again, Olive? I think it's more about, you know, in some ways the difference between the party political aspect that is in some ways the face of like a a more um a more a, a more of an ideological grounding that goes much deeper than what that we usually see and to understand that also the if we want to organize an alternative to it perhaps it's also important to understand that 
um, even with us, we need to go beyond kind of like having a attachment to a party political organizing, but how do we go beyond to make sure that there's also a genuine resistance in an ideological way? No, absolutely. Um, that's really helpful. And yeah, um, I think it's actually at the moment that argument has been made almost easier for us with the um, vehicle that drew in so much um, party political investment um, being the Corbyn I Labour Party. You know, if you'd have said, I think to many serious leftists in say 2011, you know, following Occupy or the London riots, that the Labour Party was gonna be where a lot of people who consider themselves serious activists would be investing their time. You know, you'd have been laughed out of any any room. And, and you know, that, that moment kind of appeared almost like this kind of Benjaminian rupture of all of a sudden, whoa, hang on a second, the, the lunatics are in charge of the asylum, you know, the Labour Party, which is one of the only two political parties that can gain government in the United Kingdom, you know, is, is, is being led by people with a historical and deep commitment to not only leftism, but an internationalist leftism. And I think that that moment um, drew in so much energy. But of course, you know, the, 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 um, the, the reactionary forces, both within politics and within much wider culture, cohered against that. And despite, especially after the near miss in 2017, you know, I always wish that I could have like watched the 2017 election with like, you know, some really elite members of British society and just be like, oh my goodness, like Jeremy Corbyn might be like sitting next to the Queen and like discussing parliamentary prime questions. And, um, you know, I think after that in 2019, that obviously was um, exploded and, you know, the Labour Party doesn't seem like an avenue or a venue for that kind of investment in. So I think there's almost no choice at the moment than to try and think about, you know, expressing ideas and creating new political worlds outside of that, 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 that parliamentary party structure. Um, I think that, you know, that is, that is the way the change is going to happen, not only within the United Kingdom, but, um, across the world and linking up to other organizations and other groups and other communities all around the world. Um, you know, we've seen the way in which um, a movement, even a hashtag you might describe as something like Black Lives Matter has really affected real change, exerted real leverage upon institutions of power um, uh, over, the last, over the last six, seven months. And I think that that's something that we should try and find inspiring. I also think that part of the strange culture war style attack on anti-capitalism is a backhanded recognition that capturing some elements of the parliamentary system is not the same as capturing the political consciousness and ground of the nation. And that is one of the bizarre things of 2020 with all its horror and loss and failure and cronyism that despite what the parliamentary arithmetic says, clearly, and they know it, look at Johnson's face, you know, even look at what's his face, Dom's face, they know that they have, they have not captured, it is not Thatcher, it's, it's not captured the consciousness and the hearts and minds or the political space of this nation. And if anything, there is an uncertainty about where the, um, meaningful political space of this nation this nation is right now and as Kojo says I think that's happening all over I was talking to my mother about Indian elections and the India all India strike last night and we're saying and she's saying oh no we're Bengali oh West Bengal we think the BJP will even make some gains in West Bengal which is one you know one of the last holdouts where that kind of Hindutva nationalism was not making electoral gains but at the same time that is not really what the only thing happening in India. You know, a quarter of a billion people out on the streets in a strike between farmers and workers. That means that this, where the political space is, is undecided. And the, and the energies that our enemies take to capture the formal institutions of politics, even when those formal institutions are so derided by so much of the population and, and show themselves to be ineffective or corrupt again and again, that's, that's also a kind of recognition when they come back and say, oh, we're the state, don't, don't um, abolish us, is a kind of recognition that oh, yeah, it's not done yet. One bit of it was done, but it isn't. You know, lots of it is not done. And, and you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till January, my God. 
I mean, thank you very much for those responses. Um, and thank you for everyone who tuned in on our YouTube live. This was the first time we've tried a uh, Left Book Club event in this format, and we hope it worked for all of you. Thank you very much for uh, Kojo, to Kojo for joining us as a special guest. And of course, thank you very much uh, to Gargi, but you will see um you will ha be happy to know that you'll see a lot more of gargi in this series um when while she joins uh, many exciting and amazing people in conversations about anti-capitalism um as mentioned as at the beginning the left book club is a subscription book club so um please consider uh signing up to a subscription you get a book every single month um, and there's six uh, classic books and six contemporary books every year that you get. And if you sign up soon, you will also get um, our um, festive discount. Also check, out, check us out on social media and don't forget to uh, follow the other Radical December events. You can uh, follow them through the hashtag, hashtag Radical December. And yeah, once again, thank you very much to uh, Kojo for joining us and thank you very much to Gargi and thank you for tuning in on YouTube and hope to see you in January. The January event will be on anti-capitalism and imagination. We are, we shall not reveal yet, but we will have some very, we have some very exciting speakers that uh, Gargi will be in conversation with. So hope to see you again very soon and take care and happy Christmas and Happy New Year.